Welcome everyone to our session entitled Service Provider IP Version 6 Deployment. We're glad to have you with us. A few housekeeping notes to begin. As you enter the WebEx console, you either join us by audio broadcast or by phone, which was automatically muted. Because of the large attendance or large audience in attendance today, you'll be remain muted throughout the event. When you think of a question, please feel free to enter it in our WebEx Q&A panel as you think of them. It's located in the lower right-hand corner of the console. Please leave the WebEx chat window for communication with our WebEx facilitators for any technical issues or problems you may be experiencing. This session is being recorded and you will receive an email link containing the, the information about the recorded session. We appreciate your input today regarding, uh, and there will be a short survey that will pop up when you close the, your browser at the end of the event. At this time, I'd like to introduce our moderator, Monica Lewis. Monica, the floor is now yours. Hello, and welcome to the Cisco Support Community. Today, we present a live Cisco Support Community Expert Series webcast. Our topic, Service Provider IPv6 Deployment. My name is Monica Lewis, and I am the Business Operation Manager for all knowledge sharing programs for the Cisco Support Community globally. Our expert joining us today is Salman Asadula, a Distinguished Customer Support Engineer and IPv6 Forum Fellow. Salman has co-authored several books and RFCs, including Deployment IPv6 in Broadband Access Networks. Welcome, Salman. Now, I would like to briefly outline the format of today's event. Salman will start with a short presentation on service provider IPv6 deployment for the first 35 minutes of the program, and then we will dive into the live question submissions for the remainder of the event. During our presentation, you may submit questions to be answered by Salman and a team of technical experts using the QA box on the right-hand side of your console. For technical questions, uh, please use the chat window. We will be asking polling questions today, and we really encourage you to participate answering them. You can download the presentation at the link provided in the chat window. So let's just start with the first polling question. What is your level of experience in IPv6 XP deployment? And we encourage you to answer that. A, I know basic IPv6 concepts, but no idea about IPv6 SP deployment. B, I know IPv6 SP deployment concepts. However, I do not have any practical experience. C, I know most of the IPv6 SP deployment topics, issues, and have deployment experience. Or D, I am the IPv6 SP deployment guru. Please take a moment to answer as this will give Salman an opportunity to tailor your presentation to your needs. Make sure to submit all your questions as we will answer later them in the webcast. Now, I would like to pass the mic to Salman who will, will give you an expert advice on how to deploy IPv6. Salman. Hello guys. Uh, good morning everybody. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, good evening wherever you are. Um, my name is Salman Asadullah and uh, we are glad to have you all for this web webcast. And I'm going to uh, start the, the presentation piece of this right now. So basically today, uh, what we're going to be doing, that we're going to be talking about some of these topics, just giving you highlights on some of these uh, topics related to service provider deployment, IPv6 deployment. Uh, as you know, that this is a very huge topic, So uh, and we have... Uh, literally, I have 35 minutes to kind of cover some of these topics and highlight it for you today. And just to kind of give you an opportunity to, to see what is going on in the service provider um, arena, what are some of the techniques which are available, and from there you could uh, do some more research and, and we'll provide you some good information to go and uh, follow up on these topics. And also, in future, you could post your questions on the, um, the Cisco support community for IPv6 where uh, the experts could also point you and help you some, with details on some of these topics. So basically what we're going to do, we're going to briefly cover what is the IPv6 integration strategy. Then we're going to talk in, look into the service provider core networks and the deployment models. And those basically, you know, we're going to cover both the people who are from the IP v4 camp or from the people who have MPLS deployed in their core networks. Then briefly we'll look into some of the key IPv6 address considerations and what are some of the different multi-homing solutions which are available 
TV6, and uh, in the end, we'll briefly look into uh, what are different uh, carrier grade IPv6 solutions for service providers. So, uh, what is happening right now that as uh, the internet is growing, uh, we are seeing uh, evolution. So, uh, what with the evolution, what I really mean that from on your left-hand corner, you have two bubbles, the IPv4 public and private addresses. But now, what, where we're kind of moving towards is um, we'll see some of these um, IPv4 private and public addresses, but at the same time, we'll introduce another bubble, the green bubble, which is uh, the IPv6. And what will happen if you see these three arrows, that uh, we'll see all these three activities happening in parallel. At, at the bottom of the, the first arrow you see, you're going to see that there are a lot of techniques which are, uh, which are available and customers will be trying to preserve their IPv4 addresses as, soon as, as long as possible in some cases. Uh, and at the same time, um, uh, there'll be customers who will be deploying IPv6 uh, in their infrastructure along with their IPv4 infrastructure, so they'll have these dual stack capabilities. And on the top arrow, you know, the people who will be sort of on the uh, end of the curve, and they'll be all they have all they have already done the dual stack or their native IPv6, but at the same time, they're now looking into more services and applications running over IPv6. So you ask me that, you know, at which arrow do we really are at today, at which what stage we are at today, uh, uh, the answer would be it all depends on which particular market you are in, what your applications are, what your needs are, what region you are in. So depending on that, you'll see all of these different um, uh, activities happening in any given uh, customer networks. Um, and also, this is also cool, these three arrows are, if you, you might have heard about uh, the Cisco um, uh, IPv6 um, uh, transition marketing terms, which are basically um, uh, pr uh, uh, preserve, prepare, and prosper. So initially, people will pr try to preserve, then they'll prosper with v V4 and V6, and then they, uh, they'll basically also deploy IPv6 in their applications and services. So when you look into the uh, integration and coexistence of IPv6, now, you, you might have noticed that I've used word integration and coexistence instead of migration because I, um, uh, I do not believe right now in the migration of IPv6 because we're going to see IPv4 for the longest time. So what, will be, what we're going to see for the longest time is about how well you could integrate IPv6 in your current IPv4 networks and what are the things you could do successfully for, for the coexistence of both of these protocols because to this day you see we find DECnet and Apple Talk in customer networks, and IPv4 is way more popular than DECnet and Apple Talk. So we're going to see IPv4 for the longest time uh, in customer networks, and uh, but it's going to be all about how, uh, what are different techniques, and how well you can integrate uh, um, IPv6 successfully and transparently, more importantly, in your current IPv4 networks. Now, once you're going to be going on this route of integrating IPv6 in your current IPv4 networks, you could you run into a lot of uh, different um, uh, issues and a lot of different uh, opportunities, but there's some common things every customer will be looking into. One is uh, basically what are going to be the IPv6 addressing scheme. Uh, once I get the, you know, a slash 32 or whatever um, address from uh, the, uh, the registry or from the SP, how I'm going to carve it out. Then what kind of routing protocol I'm going to be using for IPv6? Is it going to be OSPF version 3 or is it going to be ISIS for v6? Um, um, then what kind of IPv6 services I'll be able to support with IPv6 which are similar to my IPv4? Can I do I QS, multicast, and DNS uh, or not? And, and in fact, you can. Uh, then you'll be looking into some of the security issues. Uh, as you know that IPv6 has introduced a lot of new ideas, basic protocol ideas, the functionality of the protocol is is different, but at the same time, it has also introduced some of the uh, uh, the, the holes uh, which needs to be filled, and we need to make sure that we are doing uh, taking care of our security 
um, uh, challenges for IPv6 as well. Then you will be looking into the network management piece. Uh, the network management piece, you know, that how you're going to be doing network management for IPv6. Now, uh, in this case, you know, you could be in a good shape because what we're talking about in most of the cases, you have you'll see these dual stack networks. So you could use IPv4 as a transport, and on top of it, you could do IPv6. Um, you have IPv6 nibs available, where which you could use to pull the uh, answers. Uh, to pull the IPv6 information. Uh, now, one of the things to uh, kind of keep in mind, what I tell always to my customers, that there's no way you could put 10 pounds of sugar in a five pound bag. So what it really means that you have to do due diligence, you have to do your homework uh, before you kind of get on this route. It's not gonna happen that on one day you just decide that tomorrow I'm gonna turn on IPv6 and you'll, uh, you'll be able to do it. No, it's not gonna happen that way. You have to, to basically, first of all, you have to make sure that what are the requirements, you know, the processing requirements, the memory requirements, the forwarding, uh, if it's happening in hardware or not. All of these requirements has to be uh, basically seen, and, um, uh, and once those are done, you have to sort of test this network in a small um, um, uh, fashion in, a, in your lab environments and then in a small clouds of your network and then kind of roll it out from there. Now, a small example I want to give you over here from this memory and processing uh, perspective, that if you're doing OSPF version 2 in your IPv4 networks and you want to go to OSPF version 3 for IPv6, now remember, you'll have two diasters running, you're going to have two SPFs running, so you'll have to address all of these concerns. And remember that now with the going towards new protocols, deploying new protocols, some of the functionality which would change the NOC people, the, the people who are uh, operating the networks, they have to understand how to configure, troubleshoot, and all these sort of thing, good things, how they're going to do it. And for that, the training piece, it gets really, really, really important. And not just training, you know, reading or attending this one or this cast no a hands-on training and this is what very important for for the people to understand that they'll have to test everything before they even think about sort of deploying this um, uh, on a larger scale now uh, basically you know what I want to do in this piece of the presentation but just quickly cover some of the the key techniques both for the SPs uh, in the core infrastructure who have native IPv4 uh, or if they have already deployed MPLS and they have MPLS in their core networks, what are some different techniques which are available for their uh, implementation of or integration of IPv6 in their either IPv4 co um, native uh, networks or MPLS networks. Now, in the, when you look into the IPv6 native networks, the three basic techniques which are available. The first one is um, uh, tunneling IPv6 and IPv4. Like in this slide or in this picture, you could see that the SP backbone is uh, is IPv4 enabled and I have not touched the backbone at all. What I have done, I have only enabled the edges of the network, okay? Uh, the edges of the network for IPv6 or for dual stack where basically it's the terminals are being initiated and terminated. Now in this case, if a site A wanna con is running IPv6 and going to site B and they happen to be running, let's say, ISIS, then basically I could tunnel this traffic uh, all the way wherever they need to go to between site A and site B or if they want to go to internet IPv6 internet exchange or if they want to go to the IPv6 SP. So basically simply by turning on this tunneling on the edges I could turn on, I can initiate uh, you know, the, tra uh, the transport of IPv6 packets from one end to another end. Now a few things to keep in mind that these are nailed point-to-point -point tunnels, right? So you could ha run into scalability issues. So, but at the same time, this is something if you happen to be, you know, you're in the need of providing IPv6 service uh, as, as soon as possible, this could be one of the techniques to kind of uh, look into. But in the long term, you have to look into some other techniques which we'll discuss. Now, uh, choosing different tunneling schemes. There are several of the techniques, schemes which are um, uh, available, so you'll have to see that, you know, what are different techni techniques, um, which is techniques basically suits you more. You know, for instance, if this, this is ISIS on site A and uh, on site B, IPv6 ISIS, and they need to talk to each other, then I'll be basically, and they happen to be 
doing some multicast as well, IPv6 multicast, then I'll be basically turning on GRE tunneling because that is it has the capability to transport multicast and the the layer to IFS messages. So these are some of the things you have to keep in mind. But remember that this is these are nailed point to point tunnels. You have this n squared scalability issues which you could run into. Now. The next technique what we have seen is native IPv6 over dedicated data links. This is something really um, um, simple, but what some of the customers we have seen that they do not want to touch their current IPv4 networks. So what they have done that they have built parallel IPv6 infrastructure. So in this case, you could see that I have separate IPv4 and IPv6 in, even to the extent of VLANs. So we, the greens are all V6 VLANs, and v, all the green, line, green lines are following the I mean, the green lines are following the, uh, the IPv4 um, the infrastructure path, and the red lines are following the IPv6 infrastructure path. Uh, but uh, one thing, you know, being a vendor, uh, we would love people to do this thing because we will be ending up selling more equipment. But at this time of the in 2011 and end of 2011, when the, we have already run out of IPv6 addresses and people are and the search providers are moving towards. IPv6 deployment for one reason or the other. This is not the the way or the route to take at this time. What do we need to do is in the basically the next slide. So basically, what where do we want to go towards is the dual stack IPv4 and IPv6. Now in this um, uh, technique, what you're seeing that you have enabled IPv6 uh, in your current IPv4 networks. So all the devices, the PE and P device, all the core infrastructure. And you are, you are basically, it's all IPv6 enabled, so it's dual stack network. So you're running two IGPs, IP, like let's say OSPF version 2 and OSPF version 3. You have done, you know, so you have to make sure that you're meeting all the memory requirements, the forwarding requirements, the processing requirements, okay? But now, in this case, what you have done, that you're able to provide both IPv4 and IPv6 services uh, successfully to your customers, including you know IPv6 multicast or whatever things you need to be do to be uh, doing. Now this is where you know we need to sort of go towards before the time would come when when we'll have, we'll see more native IPv6 uh, at some point. But this is where you know we need to go towards if you're having um, um, a native IP. V4 network and you want to integrate IPv6 into your um, uh, current IPv4 uh, networks. So in the previous section, what we saw the three techniques, the tunneling, the dedicated data links, and um, the dual stack approach. Now, if you happen to be running MPLS in your core networks, then you basically have multiple techniques which are available to integrate IPv6 very transparently in your MPLS networks. There are several techniques but there are two of them which are more popular and have been deployed uh, throughout the search provider customer networks, which are the 6PE and 6VPE approach. So I'll quickly look into both of these approaches. But uh, keep in mind that, you know, like for instance, the last one, the native IPv6 MPLS, this is where you, the assumption is that that your the whole uh, core MPLS core is IPv6 enabled means you're doing IPv6 IGP and you're doing, you're doing IPv6 LDP. Uh, but thing with these two approaches, the 6PE and VPE, that you do not need to go towards that route. You could not, you don't have to touch your P routers, your core MPLS routers. All you need to do is need to touch the edges in both of these cases and enable IPv6 to achieve the goals which you need to. So basically, in the uh, in this first approach, the 6PE approach, you can see the uh, the slide. Um, the diagram over here, the core of this implementation is multi-protocol uh, BGP, right? So basically what is happening that now uh, what all I'm doing is basically enabling my PE routers to 6PE routers. So I'm making these PE routers as dual stack routers, which are able to uh, basically enable um, or, or transport IPv6 prefixes from one end to another end. Now, one thing to, to notice over here, that all these bubbles, right, you do not see any VPNs. All you see are the prefixes. So what I'm, not, I'm doing, that I'm basically learning these IPv6 prefixes on the 6PE routers, and I'm basically transporting them to the other 
a PE uh, using multi protocol IBGP. Now, if you look into the RFC, it's called basically BGP tunneling. So, all you're doing is basically tunneling IPv6 prefixes from one end to another end by using the, the multi protocol BGP for the IPv6 reachability. Now, this is basically a really good approach which. Uh, which uh, our customers deployed initially. Cisco is one of the inventors of this approach, and uh, in this one, you're still doing the same IPv4 IGP and IPv4 LDP in your P routers, and uh, only upgrading your P routers to uh, 6P routers, uh, and making them dual stack, supporting the 6P functionality. Now, there's some uh, benefits and drawbacks. Now, the biggest benefit, what I said, that you, you're not touching your P routers at all. All you're doing is, in, is enabling your P routers for a dual stack capability and transporting this IPv6 prefixes from one end to the other end. Now, with this approach, you can continue to do whatever you're doing with your, um, uh, you know, if you have IPv4 only on some sites or V4 VPNs only on some, some sites. But at the same time, you could have V4 and V6 on uh, these 6P sites as well, uh, transporting those both prefixes. And at the same time, you could continue to do on some sites V4 VPNs plus only V6 prefixes from one end to another end. Now, one thing to keep in mind, the people on the, on the call uh, on this webcast who understand the basics of IPv6, that their uh, peer hours won't be able to send ICMPv6 messages, right? Because uh, remember that uh, so things like TTL expired and trace route, you're not going to be able to do it. Now, keep in mind that the search provider networks they already uh, they hide their P routers, right? And they do M2 tuning up front on the PE router, so you'll have to do similar techniques over here. Uh, but uh, from the V6 perspective, you remember that you know one of the key um, uh, technique is path M2 discovery. So if you have ICMP V6 disabled, how are you going to do path M2 discovery? Again, you'll have you have a couple of choices over here for your P routers. Either you could do uh, M2 tuning up front on the P routers, or you could have, you know, uh, there are uh, images available for the P routers, very lightweight images, uh, iOS images, which you could run on the P routers, which can only support I ICMPv6 messages. Now, another thing uh, for the 6P approach is the drawback is, is that you could run into some of the scalability issues um, because you, you now you have separate rib and a fib uh, for each connected customer. So, this is certainly a good approach if you have limited devices in a PE role. Um, but as soon as you start to grow, you'll have to look into the other techniques, which are other techniques, the 6VP approach, which I'm going to cover in the next slide. But uh, for the, any more details, um, if you see the 6P documentation and presentation we have provided you over here, uh, has all the gory details about the configuration, the debugs, and all the, like how the, uh, the whole pro different protocols work to make this thing happen. Now, to the next slide, uh, let's look into 6VPE overview. Now, keep all the discussion, what I, what I just did for 6P in, in your mind, and look into this slide. Now, the one big thing you see over here, the difference is that everything is same. You don't have any IPv6 enabled in the core routers. You still have you know, IPv4 IGP and IPv4 LDP running on the P routers. But... Only this, the PE routers are now called 6V PE routers. This is, this is just a term. In, in, in essence, they are basically uh, dual stack routers capable of doing 6V PE functionality. But another important thing you see over here, now these, all the bubbles, the C sites, they're not any more prefixes, but they're VPNs, right? So VPN blue and VPN yellow, right? So basically what has happened that whatever you know, services you're providing today for your uh, 2547 bits, RFC 2547 bits for your IPv4 VPN services, you can do the same for, by using 6VPE to provide the same services for your IPv6 VPNs, right? Again, this is an RFC, and this is, um, uh, Cisco is one of the inventors of this RFC, of 4659. So whatever you're doing with your current IPv4, services you're providing for your IPv4 VPNs, you could do the same. You'll still you have the same, you know, the concepts you're using for the route reflectors, the, uh, the, uh, the route targets, uh, the RDs, everything stays the same, whatever you're doing. 
Just by doing this technique, you now you could do that for your IPv6 VPNs. Now to make this happen, we had to make few changes in the protocol. Like for instance, we had to come up with the VPN v6 addresses. Now these addresses, we still use the same 64-bit RD value plus 128-bit IPv6 address. So you got this. Uh, 192-bit um, uh, uh, VPN v6 address. Then you have the multi-protocol BGP VPN v6 addresses, which is basically a AFI uh, address family IPv6, I for IPv6 is 2, and the SAFI value is 128. Now keep in mind that the most important one is the, the AFI value, because the SAFI value is common for uh, uh, any uh, other protocol as well. So. And of, of course, we have to come up with the VPN, IPv6, multi-protocol, reach, NLRI uh, to support this. Another important thing is the encoding of the BGP next hop. Now, keep in mind for both, the, one of the basic rules of multi-protocol BGP that if I'm announcing a route from an address family, the next hop has to be from the same address family. So in order to do that, now remember that in this both 6P and VPE, what I'm doing, that I am announcing uh, 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 IPv6 route, but my own loopback address is v4 address, right? So for that, what we are using a basic uh, concept of IPv6, which is IPv4 mapped IPv6 address, we take that, we use that IPv4 address and make it look like IPv6 address to cover this of encoding of the BGP next stop from the same address family. Now, so in summary, uh, basically, this is, as I said, this is a very unique, very, um, a good approach for deploying um, to providing IPv6 um, uh, VPN services for your uh, MPLS um, uh, in your MPLS networks. Um, you could continue to do whatever you're doing with your v V4 VPNs, but with this you could also do the V6 VPNs as well. Um, some of the, the path M2 discovery ICMP V6 issues, what I discovered, what I discussed in the previous 6P section also applies over here as well. So for any more details on the 6VP uh, solution, there's a, uh, I've put a uh, URL over here which has all the gory details about the whole uh, different protocols used and how this whole technique wor works, the configuration, and uh, the troubleshooting uh, pieces of it. Now, so now, guys, if you see what we have done in the, in, from the initial to this point that we looked into the uh, quickly looked into the the IPv6 strategy integration strategy into the service provider networks. Then we looked into the the core networks, both for native IPv4 and uh, MPLS networks, and we talked about some of the key techniques which are available to integrate IPv6 into the uh, the native IPv4 networks and MPLS um, networks. Now. In this part of the presentation, let's quickly look into some of the uh, addressing considerations and uh, the MPLA uh, and some of the uh, other topics. Now, in the IPv6 address considerations, what I'm going to talk about is basically I'm going to cover two things over here. One is you when you talk about uh, IPv6 addressing considerations, uh, there are a lot of questions out there because uh, you know, they, we have different kind of addresses which are available, the pro provider assigned versus provider independent. Now in this picture over here, you're doing, you're seeing a provider assigned addresses. In this technique, you could see the SPs assign address blocks to the customers from its own address space received from its, from its upstream uh, provider. And the aggregation happens towards the upstream provider. And this basically what is happening is minimizing the internet routing table. Okay, and you could see that basically over here, uh, I'm basically, um, you know, uh, each registry has gotten a, a slash 12 to slash, 12 slash 23 from the INA, and then they're giving it to a certain slash 32 in this example to the ISP, and then the ISP is giving a slash 48 to the each site. Okay, so this is, uh, you know, a really good sort of technique for the, the reasons I, I just mentioned, uh, but at the same time, you know, it has some cons as well, because now what is happening that, that the, the customers, the end customers are locked to a, a certain provider, right? So what happens that if, if, let's say, if I do not like ISP1 at one point and I want to go to the ISP2, in that case, I'll have to do the renumbering of these my addresses because the SP1 has given me address range from, from its own address range uh, and the 
and the ISP2 would give me another address range from its own address range. So basically, I'll have to go through those. I'll, I'm sort of locked with one of the uh, providers. I'll have, to, I'll have to do renumbering. And also, the, some of the multi-homing and the load balancing issues also exist over there. On the next slide, if you see, this is the, the contrast of this, which is called the provider-independent addresses, right? Now, in this one over here, if you see, it's happening, there's no more ISP anymore. The, IR, the registry directly assigns addresses space to the end customer, right? And customers are basically no longer locked to any given uh, SP. So there's no need for doing any sort of re-addressing, right? And also, the multi-homing and the load balancing is pretty straightforward in this um, uh, technique. Uh, now, in this one, what, what the, the biggest issue, what what we see over here, one of the cons is, is that now you're going to have larger internet routing tables due to lack of efficient aggregation, right? Because in the previous example, everything was being aggregated through an SP uh, to the uh, to the internet. Now here, um, you know, we're going to see the same. Uh, say, could, we could see the same issues what we are seeing today of larger internet routing tables and also memory and CPU needs on the BGP speakers. Uh, larger memory and CPU needs because we have longer addresses. And right now in, in, in IPv4 we have you know over 350 BGP routes, 350k BGP routes, and uh, so we could run into the same issues. Now. So these were the basically two techniques, right? The PA versus the PI, I kind of highlighted some of the, uh, the key um, uh, issues. Now, when we talk, in, talk about the infrastructure addressing, there are a lot of questions that how should I basically be, uh, what should I be using? Should I be using the unique local addresses versus the global addresses? It all depends, right? The answer is all depends. Uh, the unique local addresses are more similar to what the most of the people are, are used to are the private addresses, the RFC 1918, and the global addresses are similar to uh, the global IPv4 addresses. Uh, so uh, you have both approaches available, but there are a lot of, you know, uh, perceptions that, you know, by doing global uh, um, uh, addressing, uh, it breaks the topology hiding, which, you know, uh, it's all basically debatable. So uh, what we are seeing that um, customers are also using uh, b um, both uh, ULA and global addresses, ULA internally in their networks and going out, they're using the global uh, addresses, but it comes with a price because now you'll have to do more address management, which means more DSCP, do, um, DSCP DNS routing and security for both V4 and V6. Um, uh, I mean for V6 for both address, uh, addresses for ULA and global. Uh, that's something to kind of keep in mind that as far as, you know, how the addresses, what addresses are used, there's a uh, technique which is called SAS, a source address selection, which basically is used to make sure that what address is used for the source and destination. So this is something to keep in mind. Another important thing from the addressing point, uh, you know, it comes, um, uh, always uh, comes on the table about the, the link uh, level that what prefix lengths should be considered. So we have three choices over here, sort of. 64-bit uh, uh, prefixes, less than 64, and greater than 64. Um, now, the 64-bit prefixes, this is what is a common recommendation according to RFC 3177, and also it's basically more used, we see, in, within the customer bases because with doing this, by using 64 bits um, uh, prefixes, you could use all the different goodies of IPv6, and also the way the different protocols are written around uh, IPv6, they use, they assume that everything is, um, is mostly things are configured at slash 64, um, like things like Slack, source, stateless address auto configuration to use a slash 64, and, and, and keep in mind that, you know, you do lose, address space by using slash 64, but still, by having a slash 64, you still leave with the 64-bit host ID, which could support way more than, um, you know, the number of hosts any media can support efficiently today, right? Um, so less than slash 64 is considered not a good practice, and greater than slash 64 is, is basically is used in certain situations. So for instance, today on the point-to-point -point interfaces, we use slash 30 or slash 31 uh, to save the addresses. And uh, similarly, you know, using slash 126 and slash 127 are also 
um, a valid addresses for point-to-point -point interfaces. Slash 128 is a valid loopback address. Um, now, what we're also seeing with a lot of customers that they're using uh, slash 126 or slash 127 on point-to-point -point interfaces, but they're reserving that slash 64. So then they're not using it for anything else. They're just, you know, reserving it and using the from the same range slash 126 or 127 for point-to-point -point interfaces. So these are some of the things to keep in mind. Now, the prefix allocation for, if you are an SP and you are doing some of the prefix allocation to your customers, right? So you have, a, you know, a choices of different, uh, what we are seeing are um, multiple ways uh, search providers are doing slash 48, slash 52, 56, 60s, or slash 64 prefixes being assigned uh, to their customers. What they're doing is, you know, the, to the enterprise customers, they assign slash 148, I mean slash 48, and also, so they are left with 16 uh, bits to play with for their subnets. So they could have 2 to the power 16 number of subnets. Uh, but for larger enterprises, you could have one or more or multiple of slash 48s which you could give to your uh, customers. Uh, small business customers receive slash 58, 52 or slash 56 uh, depending on the needs. And the broadband customers using DCP prefix delegation receives what we're seeing a slash 56 or slash 60 uh, addresses. So there's a polling question for you based on this, this discussion that what would be a valid point-to-point -point interface, prefix line for a point-to-point -point interface, slash 64, slash 126, slash 127, or there are several including slash 64, slash 126, and slash 127. So basically uh, answer that as you're, at your convenient. Now, really quickly, uh, what I would like to do is to you know, uh, talk about some of the, um, the multi-homing uh, solutions, right? So when we look into the, the multi-homing uh, solutions today uh, is, um, you know, the basic goal stays the same. Nothing changes with IPv6. You still want to, why do you want to do multi-homing? You want to provide a redundancy. You want to do load sharing. These are the two basic reasons, right? These two reasons stays the same. Now, with IPv6, there are a few uh, options which are available. The first one you're seeing over here is basically the traditional multi-homing, which you're used to today, right? And which is uh, basically, you know, it's called in the v 6 world what with, I just discussed briefly is the PI, provider independent, right? So you, uh, the ad advertised spa uh, address space uh, to multiple transit providers, uh, longer prefixes to prefer a ISP uh, for load sharing, but it's basically what it's going to happen that it's going to bring, again, have the same issue what you have seen on IPv4, large BGP routing tables, right? But what we are seeing today, that and to this point, you know, there are not, not, not that many IPv6 uh, prefixes, BGP prefixes, but this is what we are seeing customers are doing today. But there are some other approaches which are also available uh, with IPv6. Right, so uh, the next one is the dual address blocks from upstream ISP. So in this case, what is happening, you're using provider assigned addresses from ISP1 and ISP2. They're both giving you their own prefixes from different ranges, right? Uh, so now you're basically receiving and utilizing address blocks, blocks from both SPs. And, and, but again, keep in mind that if I'm, you know, it's still the same issues with the PA uh, exist, the overhead and the renumbering problems. So if I'm a host one, I could have, you know, uh, I, uh, address A from ISP1 and address B from ISP2, right? And then again, I'll have to use SAS for, uh, you know, going um, uh, source address selection, to how I kind of get out and do the load balancing and uh, multi homing So these are some of the things you have to further look into. Another way uh, which we have also, you know, uh, uh, seen and been discussed is the NAT66 uh, with proxy. So in that case, you know, you're doing address independence without PI. You're not using any more PI. You could use either PA or um, uh, ULA address space within your network and going out, you're basically doing NAT, you know, from 6 to 6. So in that case, what you're doing is you're basically... Uh, uh, translating IPv6 address to another IPv6 address. But again, you have to kind of keep in mind that you're again getting into the NAT business and the performance, the memory, the processing, the states to keep and all those 
sort of things needs to be looked into. Now, with IPv6, uh, another uh, concept which has been um, also introduced for multi-homing is LISP. Uh, and LISP is basically, is, you know, IPv6, um, uh, it's basically called the, it's one of the new approaches which is implemented or invented by Cisco. It's called the Locator ID uh, Separation Protocol. And in this case, this is, you know, it's a, it's a new address family agnostic routing architecture that implements a new semantic uh, for addressing that creates two namespaces. So you have the, the, the endpoint identifier and you have the routing locator, which is called the R locks, and you basically you're using, um, without making any changes at the host, you're ma making the, the changes at the network uh, side, and you're basically encapsulating, decapsulating, and using this technique to do uh, um, multi-homing um, efficiently. Now, for the lack of the time, I, do, I cannot get into the details, but what I've done over here is put a really good URL for your review uh, later on about this approach, that how this could be used for the multi-homing purposes. So here, what I've done, I've kind of given you some of the things which are being done out there for, for these users. So now, in this uh, section, I'm going to quickly cover um, these uh, techniques which are used for the, uh, uh, which are also called carrier-grade IPv6 solutions uh, for different purposes within search provider networks. So the first technique is basically NAP triple four solution. Now in this slide, if you look into the, uh, into the uh, diagram, what is happening? You have not done anything for moving towards IPv6. All you have done is basically you're buying some more time. So NAT44 is basically the traditional IPv4 NAT. So here, the search provider at the RG, at the residential gateway, they're doing uh, a translation from, from private to private, and then basically the, you know, you're dropping at the core network, you, you're dropping a CGN device, NAT44 CGN device. Basically, this device is multiplexes several customers onto the same public IPv4 address and it sends it out. So in this whole slide, you, you, all you're doing in this technique, you're not doing anything to moving towards IPv6, but you're just kind of buying more time to preserve your IPv4 uh, techniques, but the long-term solution is to go towards IPv6. In this technique, in IPv6 over L2TP softwares, again, the same slide, you see the residential access aggregation edge and core network. Now, at the residential gateway, uh, you're still doing the same IPv4 over PP over E and going towards the IPv4 BNG, which is providing all the layer 3 services, bypassing all the access and aggregation layer um, uh, network. In this one, in this technique, what we are saying that you drop a basically IPv6 LNS in your core network, which is the L2TP network server, and basically you're bringing from your dual stack RG all your V6 traffic and terminating it on the IPv6 LNS, which is basically sending it all over to the IPv6 internet. This is a very limited in, in, uh, investment and in, um, it could provide IPv6 services to your customers, and by in, simply dropping this IPv6 LNS in your core networks and making your RG a dual stack um, a device. Now another uh, technique is IPv6 over IPv4 uh, YS6RD. This is one of the, uh, the, the famous techniques which is being used um, by several service providers. With this one, you, uh, you're introducing two new uh, components, the 6RD CE and the 6RD BR. Um, the whole access aggregation and edge network and core network, as a matter of fact, is all IPv4 only. And basically, you're only dropping this, making this 6RD BR, which is a, a dual stack device, and it's basically you're tunneling all the IPv6 traffic uh, or your IPv4 infrastructure, terminating it on the 6RD and sending it to the IPv6 internet. In this one, basically, if you remember the 6 to 4 tunneling mechanism, where you build, you, were, you had the 2001 address followed by the IPv4 address space, making it look like a v6 address space, is the same idea, but it's more scalable. Now you have a global IPv6 address followed by the IPv4 address by using these two techniques. It's totally simple, stateless, and automatic IPv6 and in, in v4 in cap, dcap function, and it uses the old IPv4 routing infrastructure to route from one end to another end. So something to look into, RFC 5569. Now in this slide, what is happening with IPv4 via IPv6 
using DS Lite. Now, this is totally the opposite of what we have just discussed. Now, the assumption over here is that whole uh, access aggregation edge and core network is all IPv6 enabled, okay? And, and you have inter you're introducing basically two components. The, at the RG, you have the component called B4, basic bridging broadband element, and AFTR, which is the address family transition router. If this is the, the situation where you, the search providers still have dual stack um, devices at the, at, in the, at the RG side and they want to provide some services like for instance IPv4 internet access, right? So they could tunnel all this traffic uh, bypassing all the IPv4 infrastructure terminated on the AFTR and provide that IPv4 internet access to these residential gateway customers. Uh, but again, uh, the assumption over here is that IPv4 has been phased out and IPv6 only ex access and aggregation network layer exists. Now in this one, again, uh, another step ahead is called connecting IPv6 only with IPv4 only AFT64, Address Family Translation 64. Now in this slide, in this picture you see, you don't see any more IPv6 at all, right? But there are some IPv4 own, uh, I mean IPv6 only, these customers at the residential gateway, they want to access some of the IPv4 only uh, public internet or IPv4 only uh, data center. In that case, you'll have to drop in a new core network, NAT64 and that DNS64 devices, which could do this translation and get your IPv6 only endpoints to the IPv4 only endpoints. Now again, uh, the assumption over here is the network structure and the services are fully transitioned to IPv6 and IPv4 has been phased out. So here is, you know, a quick introduction what I pro kind of provided you for all the different uh, techniques which are available for search provider deployment. In the end, I would like to uh, emphasize on this that there are a lot of technologies and approaches which are available. Make sure you do the, the due diligence, you test it in your lab environment, in your small part of your network before you're rolling it out. Make sure you're aware of the hardware and software forwarding differences. You're aware of the forwarding. I mean the, the, the memory and the, uh, and the processing power um, uh, issues, you're uh, aware of new protocols and the functionalities, and that is only going to come with the proper training and the hands-on training and the hands-on experience with the protocols. Uh, and don't assume, you know, that every vendor you have in your, in your network has the IPv6 plan or the devices available. And also keep in mind, have a right expectations that the full parity between V4 and V6 is still ways off. So what you have to see that what is the need today for your network and what are the features which are available to get you that, to get you to that goal. So this is something to keep in mind. So in the end, you know, I would like to say that from here, do not stop this journey of IPv6 SP deployment. Go on to the uh, IPv6 support community, uh, which we have put together for you. Over 200,000 top technical experts are contributing to this. Post your questions to follow up with this um, uh, live webcast. You know, there will be a lot of uh, technical experts which could help you. Uh, Cisco and non-Cisco experts who are sharing the experience for the deployment, related to the deployment. Please go ahead and use that. And uh, we are here, basically Cisco is here um, to help you with this integration and migration towards IPv6. In the end, uh, there's some good references and I'll take this opportunity to uh, introduce my uh, book as well, which I um, wrote with the Wiley Publications, uh, Deploying IPv6 and Broadband Access Networks. It covers in detail the things which I've covered in 35 minutes in more details and um, uh, it's a good read with a lot of examples of the configuration and the debugs from Cisco IOS as well with some real life case studies of these deployments for our uh, in the appendixes um, uh, which have deployed IPv6 in their networks. Also there's some really good websites which are available for your reference to get a lot of information which is available. In the end, uh, I would like to ask you another polling question. In order to enable the SP core to provide IPv6 services, which of the following is the right approach? First, enable the core of MPLS for MPLS, then deploy MPLS 6 PVP solution to provide IPv6 services. First, disable MPLS from the SP core, make it native IPv4 core network, then use GRE tunneling to provide IPv6 services. First, disable MPLS 
from the SB core, make a dual stack core network to provide IPv6 services. There are several techniques available to enable SB core to provide IPv6 services without any disruption and major changes to current IPv4 native or MPLS enabled core. You could use tunneling, dual stack, MPLS6, PVP, and other solutions based on your needs and preferences. Please take a poll on the right answer. So I, at this point, I leave the uh, floor. I, I know that uh, the panelists are diligently answering all the questions which are being asked. Um, but if you have any more questions, please go ahead. So thank you, Solomon, and great presentation. Also, thank you, everyone, for participating in this uh, event polling. Now it's time to answer some of the questions that you, that you have asked. So let's jump uh, right away to we will have time for only a handful of questions. So the first question, Solomon, is the following. I have seen other vendors are generating IPv6 explicit label 2 to do IP lookup rather than doing MPLS switching at the egress node. Uh, can you comment on that? Uh, so as I said, you know, there are multiple approaches which are available. Um, uh, even the 6P and VP approach, you know, it's not only relevant to MPLS, it could be done on IPsec, GRE, LTTP. So, you know, there are multiple uh, approaches which are available and you're, uh, you know, most welcome to look into it and look into what, how the search providers have deployed on large scales. But according to our experience, what we have seen that most of the large search providers have used either uh, for their MPLS uh, for the MPLS networks, they have used 6P or VP approaches uh, to provide scalable services. Correct. Now, next question. In an MPLS network, would you recommend to share the route reflector with IPv4 network just via creating V6 address family or using separate route reflectors just for the V6 VPNs? You have both approaches available. Uh, next question. It says, we do not have any true P routers. All P routers provide PE functionality. Does this have any varying on deploying, on deploying 6PE or 6VPE solution? So in, in, in the case of what I'm understanding from this question, you're saying that you do not have any PE routers. You simply have PE routers. In that case, you'll have to make those PE routers either 6PE router if you want to just transport prefixes from one PE to the end of the PE. If you want to provide VPN services, then you will have to make those PE routers as six VPE routers. We have time for two more questions. The last one is, I'm sorry, is there a requirement to implement default IPv6 route in MPLS where default static is pointed towards upstream? You, in the end, you just cut off. I think just pose this question on the on the, uh, uh, with the panelists, and they'll further ask what are some of the details and answer. So the last question is, which operating system support IPv6? Uh, all the operating systems, you know, are now supporting IPv6. Even, you know, all the operating systems um, from, you know, from even uh, the, the Androids and the Apples and the, and the Macs and the, everything is now uh, Linux, Unix, uh, Windows, uh, Cisco, June, all our different vendors, they're all supporting uh, IPv6. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you, Salman. Uh, great presentation. Um, and thank you also, everyone, for participating. This concludes the Q&A portion of today's event. Remember that the, five, the first five listeners to complete the evaluation will receive a, a $20 gift card. So please fill out the evaluation. If you have uh, more questions, please feel free to ask them in the uh, support community. Just go to the IPv6 transition uh, community and you can ask all your questions there. Uh, we are going to be posting both the video and a document with all the questions and answers on the, on the link out there in the community. It will be ready by next Monday at the latest. So we want to announce three upcoming webcasts. Uh, the first one is in Japanese, so if you speak Japanese, uh, you, can, you can get to the next uh, webcast. Uh, it's going to be on troubleshooting NAT and common performance issues on Cisco firewalls. It's going to be on the 714, and the, the registration link uh, is in the chat. 
the also the next English webcast is going to happen on January 17th. Uh, it's going to be from India, uh, so it's going to happen at 12.30 p.m. India time. And the topic is troubleshooting tools to analyze high CPU utilization for issues uh, on the 6500. So we, we highly recommend you to attend to that webcast as well. And uh, we don't have the topic yet, but the next Spanish webcast is going to be on January 31st at 9 a.m. Uh, Mexico City time, 10 a.m. Uh, Eastern time. We have a variety of media, uh, social media that you can go to. Uh, we have Facebook, Twitter, YouTube. Uh, you can also download the IT Tunes uh, and look at in the community for I, uh, iPhones. And, and we also have presence in LinkedIn, so we welcome you to participate on those mediums as well as they are there for helping you. Uh, as you may see, we have uh, different languages, and you can just go to the Spanish, Polish, or Japanese uh, communities. We are about to launch the Portuguese community, uh, and it's going to be available in January, starting January. The registration link to the pilot is, is in the chat, as well as uh, we are also piloting the Russian, and we expect to, uh, to launch a Russian uh, community in, in March. Uh, this concludes the presentation today. I really want to thank the expert Salman Asadullah for sharing his expertise with us today. I also want to thank all the experts, uh, Srinivasa Nepali, Luke De Gain, Adriana Vaskan, Wen Sang, and Andrew Gurchenko uh, for answering some of the technical questions today. Uh, thank you and have a great day. Thank you.